Iris, congratulations on making this Thank movie. You. And congratulations on sufficiently melding Korean American culture and tradition into like a fully effective like genre horror film uh, that is readily sort of consumable by a lot of different people now, right? Yes, mommy trauma is very universal. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, I want to I want to ask you, what is the genesis of Oma of the movie Oma? Um, uh, where did this story come from? The intention was really to write a script that was very contained, something that I could direct, and it actually took me a little bit to actually make the decision to tell the story through uh, a Korean American lens. And I didn't want to tell a story that was specifically about being Korean American or specifically something about um, the culture. I just really wanted to sort of embrace this idea that we can just exists and we have the texture and the nuance of our experience in our daily lives but we're not constantly walking around thinking like oh I'm doing this because I'm Korean or this is a, a very Korean thing it just really is part of our our makeup and so that part really excited me in, in the sense that I can I can work within the genre and I could really tap into these universal themes of, of motherhood and mother and daughter relationships um, but have the characters have that specificity of the Korean American sort of experience. And so a lot of it was really sort of tapping into my own experience of feeling like I was, you know, and I think a lot of people can relate to this of just being, you know, am I in this world? Am I in that world? Am I am I in neither? You know, and sort of grappling with the, the, the theme of identity too. I think a lot of these characters, you know, they're not only confronting, you know, particularly for Sandra's character, her identity as a daughter and a mother, um, but they're also grappling with their identity as, you know, sort of accepting their, their culture and their heritage. I think it's really interesting that we've arrived at this moment where we can use both the, the tropes of uh, stories that are familiar to us, uh, stories about identity, stories about immigrant uh, context, stories about generational trauma and the passing along of, of both tradition and sometimes the scars that come with the tradition, but through this lens that is extremely pop culture, you know, kind of genre focused, it's like almost like the pitch session is something like, imagine Joy Luck Club, but they're zombies or something, you know? That was our pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have Sam Raimi on your side. So, I, and, and actually to that end, I mean, was this always a horror movie when you first thought of it? I mean, there, there are, there's a multiverse of ways in which you could have told this story without having that overlay of potential supernatural, uh, you know, uh, not quite clear uncanniness and eeriness to it. When you first thought of this, was this meant to be a horror film? Yeah, the intention was always to sort of work in the genre space, and I think really what I I thought about a lot in this process of being able to balance the genre with the characters and the relationship and that I was always focusing on that because for me personally when I watch uh, you know a horror movie or a genre movie if I can't connect to the characters if I feel like I, I don't know what the way in is that it doesn't it doesn't matter what's happening around them that you know I, I don't quite believe it and so for me it was really just you know thinking so much about the character and character motivations and the sort of uh, very complicated relationship between these characters that was always sort of the driving force. You know the, you know it is it is a genre movie, and it's it's low budget. Um, clearly, though, I'm not saying that in a bad way. Like if you're resourceful, you use you know limited locations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, all that makes it easier to make the movie. That said, I'm not certain this movie could have made been made ten years ago or even five years ago. I'm wondering if you had any hurdles getting it made with such a so with such specificity in you know in with sort of all the Koreanness in it, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know what happened in the last few years is that uh, we all realized that the most important color is green, and so once certain movies started making a certain number of dollars in the box office, I think um, you know as crass it as it as it is. That, that's when people started to pay attention, and you know, honestly, I, I have to uh, give a shout out to my partner right there, Brian. <laughs> he, um, when I first started writing this project, it wasn't, it actually wasn't through, uh, you know, I didn't have the Korean American characters because I, uh, because I didn't think I could get it made. 
you know. And so my first uh, my first film was a documentary about Korean American family. My you know uh, short thesis film at Columbia. I had uh, a Korean American actor play the role. Uh, it wasn't necessarily like specifically a Korean American character, but I wanted to at least have that face on screen. Um, but I was still sort of struggling to like break into the industry, and I thought, you know, this is going to be a hurdle if I have the Korean American characters. So I'm gonna. I'm going to make it a little bit more sort of just characters, you know, without a specificity to it. And I was really struggling actually with the with that story. And he really encouraged me to say, you know what, don't don't think about what uh, you think people want to read. Just if you if there's something that you want to explore, like just just do it. Really, just come from like a sort of like an authentic place. And so that really kind of like freed me up to just like write it in this way and, and being able to tap into my own experiences and. And it just happened to be after like Get Out had come out and Crazy Rich Asians, what really sort of blew open the doors of what could be a sort of more quote unquote like universal commercial kind of uh, story. And so it was really also just good timing. And so like once I wrote the script and we were ready to send it out, it was actually very fast. I had my executive producer, Matt Black is right over there. And he was one of the first people to read the script. And that was February of 2019, right? February 2019. And we were in Vancouver prepping for the movie January 2020. So within a year of you know starting to really put the script out, it, we were already in pre-production. And part of it was having Sam Raimi and Sandra attached, but um, it was really encouraging to see that those barriers had really changed over the last few years. Um, we are living in the Sandrasans right now. <laughs> yes. We're just living in it. This is the Sandrasans. Can you talk about getting Sandra O? Oh? Um, I still pinch myself every day. I, I feel like I don't believe that she actually signed on to this movie, even though I've just seen her in it. But yeah, I mean, when I wrote the script, I really had her in mind, and I thought, you know, like we're never gonna get her, you know, a because she's Sandra O, oh, and b I wasn't even sure that she would be interested in this kind of movie. Um, I hadn't really seen her in, doing any sort of genre work, and so um, when we got Sam Raimi's company attached, and uh, we were thinking about casting, you know, they asked me like, who is your dream actress? And I was like, Sandra. Oh, obviously, like. I have no idea if she's going to even pick up the phone and even consider this, but like, let's let's try. So we reached out to her team, and you know, luckily she was in a, sort of a, a point in her career where she was very consciously making decisions about the roles that she was going to take. In terms of, she wanted to make sure that every character that she played had layered an, a, a, an element of her sort of ethnicity and her identity, and you know, not that it had to be so present in the role, but that it had to be acknowledged. It had to be part of the sort of character and so I think when she sort of and she hadn't read the script when we first met her she just kind of knew the sort of overall story and the log line um, and she was very also very eager to work with other sort of uh, Korean American uh, females and so you know in that first meeting um, I remember she asked like is it is it scary reading a horror script like should I read it during the daytime <laughs> like, I'm like I, I just keep lights on, you know, like, I, 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 you know, and so, um, but once she read the script, she was really, I think part of it also was not just the fact that it was a Korean American character that, you know, she also has very strong uh, feelings and relationship with her own mom. And I think so in a weird twisted way, it was both of a, like for us, a love letter to our moms who we both adore. Um, and so, but I think that sort of relationship, it's like, you know, I think with immigrant families, it's so, that dynamic is so intense because the experience of immigrating to a foreign country can be so intense that I think that really sort of forges a certain kind of relationship that I think, you know, if these characters were just supporting roles in another movie, it could feel you know, a bit like the tiger mom or the, you know, certain kind of uh, image of a, a, a Korean mother, but allowing these characters to be their own main characters that we spend the time to understand like why these, you know, the, the motherhood in the sort of Korean American community is and can be a certain way, you know, I think it really allowed us to explore it in a much deeper way. I, I love that it's a, a love letter to your mom and your mom's like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, to that point about timing, uh, it's really shocking to me that we're we're now in a month, in an era, in which you can go out and basically say, uh, I'd like to buy tickets for that movie about this overbearing Asian mom who, when she gets rejected, turns into a monster, and then the person will say, which one? <laughs> the one with Sandra Oh. Oh, wait, which one? You know, it's like, we're, we're, uh, we're at this place now where the kinds of stories that historically would have starred, you know, white people and be told in white 
contexts now have a certain specificity to them. But more importantly, uh, we are in a place where we can actually tell stories that seem similar in very nuanced and different and, and extravagantly uh, unique fashion at the same time. Uh, and I, I feel like that, in some ways, is the great blessing of arriving at this moment. You mentioned the Tiger Mom thing. I, I, I wanted to ask about that because there are people who probably will say, oh, there's something problematic about the framing of this. this you know, there's something stereotypical about the clingy Asian mom. But I feel we've earned the right to be problematic. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we have to be good all the time in how we tell stories. And now we're finally at a place where it feels like we can talk about the monsters in our closets. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's really just a coincidence that this movie and Turning Red, which has sort of that type of sort of mother character have, have both come out. I mean, really, I think that there is something in our sort of experience and our, our subconscious that, you know, that, you know, film or, filmmakers like me are like, are trying to explore. And, you know, just to be clear, like, if my mom was that overbearing, I would not be in film. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, she was, they, they didn't understand what meant to like go into the film, but like they never said no you can't do it you know and so like my parents were actually quite supportive even within the context of you know not encouraging me to do it they just said okay we don't know what you're doing so we'll just we'll go with you to LA to make sure that at least you get like a good apartment and you know whatnot um, and so you know so in that sense like I'm very grateful that I have you know parents that are very supportive but I think you know for me what I was really trying to explore was you know as an adult and confronting my parents as people that are not just my parents that they had a life before and outside of me that you know from for me really this attempt to understand like how how difficult it was for my parents in in immigrating to this country and the things that they tried to hide from me you know so that i could just have like a, a good um you know an easier life and so a lot of it does come from that sort of gratitude and um trying to understand who these people are um outside of that context of parents you know i think everybody here wants to know has your oma seen the movie <laughs> and what does she think <laughs> My mama has not seen this movie yet. Uh, I hope she doesn't. <laughs> um, she kind of knows what it's about. Um, she actually, our family has this little like Google group email thing and she sent an email to all of my like Korean relatives and in Korean she like she like sent the link to the trailer and in Korean she was like look at my daughter's hard work and then she said something like the Korean version of like make sure you smash that like button on YouTube and I was like oh my I, I cannot believe this is happening <laughs> so she's you know she's being very supportive uh, so this is where I put on my like university uh, critical studies hat, <laughs> uh, because uh, the thing about the film is not only is it beautifully crafted. I mean, there are images in there that are so wild and, and resonant and and eerie just because of the way you shot them. You know, turning the camera upside down or overlaying faces or you know doing really kind of subtle shifts in the tonality of the color. Um, but they're also like what seem to be interesting metaphoric layers to it. And I'm not sure how, how much I'm inventing this in my head mm -hmm. and how much of this is something you thought about. Uh, I was thinking a lot about the bees, mm -hmm. right? And the, the fact that the bees, you know, represent something interesting about the connection between mother and daughter. Yeah. Because, you know, bees are basically uh, female queens with lots of daughters who are slaves. <laughs> the men are not necessary. They're basically use them and lose them. Uh, and they, they, when they buzz, they sound like well, electricity. Yeah. And electricity, of course, is both a source of power and energy, but also a source of pain when applied uh, excessively. And, and it, it feels like, in some ways, you, the way you're defining uh, the connection of love, right? So I'm wondering whether these are things that we are supposed to be taking away from this, or am I projecting this so I can write an essay later or something? <laughs> no, I mean, you really hit it, uh, hit it on the head. <laughs> Good job, A plus, gold star. Um, yeah, you know, I, I really wanted to also, you know, like, uh, 
just the visual of these like East Asian faces in a setting that, you know, I, I, you, that I think just we're not that familiar with in terms of, you know, I think you know a lot of Korean immigrants are in the big cities. I myself have, you know, have lived in Chicago, New York, and LA. So just like having that visual of like these uh, East Asian faces uh, against a very sort of like farm-like Americana backdrop was something that I really wanted to play with. Um, and also with the bees, it just was such a sort of like a specific sort of way to farm. It's not just about raising sort of the animals, but I wanted to find a way that, you know, also subconsciously kind of, you know, because for, for Sandra's character, the great irony of her character is that, you know, she does everything. She goes to these extremes to not become her mother. I mean, she even takes away, subconsciously takes away the uh, electricity in the house so that it, it doesn't tempt her to become her mother, but in doing so, she be she becomes her mother and she ends up sort of embracing this thing that sounds like electricity, that it could cause pain similar to electricity. And so really playing with like, even with the sound design where it's like, you know, is it bees, is it electricity, sometimes it's both and layered. And also the duplicity of sort of, you know, that bees can provide something so sweet and it could be very therapeutic, but it could also be very sort of scary. And that is the sort of duality of, I think, parenthood is that like you do get so much love and affection from them, but when they're mad, you know, watch out. So, um, yes, yeah, so we definitely was playing with that. This is going to be a, a, a large a dose of Korean culture mm. to a mainstream audience that, you know, we normally, we, we get little doses here and there through pop culture, but I think this is a big one, big injection of that. What are you hoping people will get from uh, sort of the, the Korean-ness that's, in the, that's injected in the film, like the, the tradition, the mask, the jeza, the hanbok, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think when I was growing up, there was a lot of sort of I I internalized sort of, you know, shame and embarrassment sometimes, like going to school and being one of the only Asian kids and feeling like, oh, I don't want to be different. And, you know, like when my friends would come over, I'd be like, okay, make sure the kimchi's in the basement so they didn't smell it, you know? And, and so just a lot of sort of like trying to hide this specific sort of like elements. And now it's like, you know, kimchi's everywhere and like, you know, people are much more open to it. And, you know, it is sort of like this wonderful time where I feel like I don't have to hide that part of myself and that I could actually sort of embrace it. And so, you know, for example, like the Jessa ceremony is something that's very near and dear to my heart because my family does it every year um, for New Year's. And at first I thought it was just like this, almost like a chore, you know, I didn't really understand it. And, you know, my parents were really, really sort of uh, uh, deliberate about we, we have to do this for our, you know, for our elders. And, you know, I think over the years, I sort of just came to this realization that like, oh, they're not really doing it for their, their parents and their elders, they're doing it for themselves. You know, it's their way to feel like, you know, it's not just about being a good parent. So much of the, the I think, Korean identity is just family in general. And so, you know, it's very important for my mom and my dad to feel like they are good children, even when their parents are not around. And so, so that part was really inspiring to me. And I also felt like, oh my God, my parents are such good kids and I'm terrible. <laughs> you know, like it kind of set the bar really high. And so, you know, I think when I think of Jessa, I think like when I do, you know, uh, eventually do it for my own parents, it's something that is going to be really for, for myself versus just like, oh, I'm doing it because my parents want me to. And when I end up doing it, it's going to be sort of my own version. And I think that's what's so fun about traditions that you kind of can just make it your own. So like, you know, when my brother and I do it, we'll probably have like pizza or barbecue or whatnot. But like, it doesn't matter because as long as we're doing it and thinking about our parents, like that's kind of what matters. Um, and so, yeah, so it was really sort of important for me to like be able to kind of just have that visual of, and especially them at the end, accepting that this ceremony is not like this bad thing it's actually something that helps to heal and connect them to their to their past everybody's invited to my pizza cheza yes <laughs> all, right. all right thank you very much and uh you guys gonna be